Last week I polled you guys to try to get a sense of where everyone stood on this whole Miyoko's drama and I was pretty surprised to see that 71% of you had no idea what I was talking about and 24% of you said you hadn't decided yet. This indicated to me that this is a topic that we need to delve further into and discuss more to try to make some sense of. I know a lot of vegans are feeling really confused about this topic right now, what they should do, and Seemingly even more of you actually have no idea what's going on at all So I thought what better way to welcome you guys back to my channel than to delve into what has Arguably been the biggest news story in the vegan world in quite a long time So first we're going to go over what happened just an overview of the drama to catch everyone up to speed So we're all on the same page then I'm going to talk about Miyoko Shinner's history and how she came to be the founder of one of the most if not the most successful vegan cheese company of all time then we're going to take a look at the Miyoko's product launch timeline because I think this gives us some really interesting insights into what possibly may have been going on behind the scenes. And then lastly, I'm going to get into where I stand on this whole topic, if we should still support Miyoko's, what I personally plan on doing. And that's it, so let's get into it. On February 16th, 2023, it was announced that Miyoko's Creamery was parting ways with its founder, Miyoko Shinner, as the CEO of the company, AKA she was fired. Now the press release the company put out was pretty standard, pretty much what you would expect, one thing stood out to me is that they said they would be selling new products that contain only plants, no animal ingredients, in order to eliminate animal suffering, reduce environmental stress, and improve human health. A lot of people were concerned that them parting ways with Miyoko meant that they would now start incorporating animal ingredients, so not only do they clarify, no, we won't be doing that, but they do list eliminating animal suffering as the first of three reasons to not use animal ingredients. So while everyone was sort of reeling from this press release, it turned out that this wasn't actually news per se. Miyoko made a statement shortly after this on LinkedIn where she clarified that she had actually been fired seven months prior to this announcement in June 2022. She claimed that the timing of this press release coincided with her well-publicized fundraiser for her farm animal sanctuary where she would be unavailable to comment. She also said conflict grew around the best path forward for future growth while continuing to live our values founded on the principles of veganism and animal rights as well as our B Corp status. She said she was unwilling to agree to restrictions that would have made any ongoing role she played at the company for appearances only. And she also said she was patronizingly described as taking the company from zero to one. In the final paragraph, she says, I wish the best for the company I founded, led, and grew. This phrase, zero to one, uh, really stood out to Miyoko herself and I think to a lot of other people. You know, she mentioned it in her statement, she hashtagged it at the end of her statement, she uploaded an Instagram video talking about it. So this quote came from a February 16th interview in Food Navigator, so this is the day the news came out. One of the investors, a guy named James Joaquin, who is the co-founder of Obvious Ventures, gave this interview. So let me just disclaim this now, I know very little about the world of venture capital, there's probably some of you who know a lot more about it than I do, but I do know that there are various funding rounds. Miyoko's has raised almost $60 million total. Obvious Ventures was part of the B and C funding rounds, which together raised $58 million. So in this interview with Food Navigator, James Joaquin explained that the split boils down to the board's view that what got Miyoko's Creamery from a small startup to its well-recognized leadership position in the plant-based dairy segment is not the same skill set needed to get to the next level. It's never my first choice to part ways with a founder, but it is often the case that the skill set of a founder, that innovation engine to go from zero to one, to just create a new category that didn't exist, those skills are often not the same skills to go from one to a hundred and then scale that. Joaquin noted the board tried to craft a new non-executive role for Shinner, which she referred to in her LinkedIn post. He said, we are optimistic that Miyoko will remain on the board of directors. Her name is on the box and she is still a large owner of the business. So many people, including Miyoko, including me, were pretty offended by the term zero to one. I think just hearing that, the optics don't sound great of like, oh yeah, this woman took it 
you know, 1%, and now the rest of us are gonna take it from one to 100 and then beyond that. However, after doing some research, I found that the term zero to one came from a book of the same name by Peter Thiel, who is a billionaire entrepreneur. He's the co-founder of PayPal. I don't know if Peter Thiel invented the term zero to one, but he certainly popularized it through this book. In Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, he advocates that entrepreneurs build something unique, something that completely changes the market, a solution that does not exist yet, going from zero to one, rather than building something that is incrementally better than an existing solution, going from one to N. Going from zero to one means going from nothing to something. This is the greatest leap possible greater than going from one to 10 or even from one to 100. To go from zero to one is to conjure something into existence from the dark void of oblivion. This is the essence of true innovation. Now that I know more about it, I do not think that Mr. Joaquin meant this as a slight at all. I actually think that he meant it as a huge compliment. He's essentially saying Miyoko performed a magic trick. She did the unthinkable. She did a thing that so many people try to do and only a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of humanity will ever achieve. And essentially now, she needs to let the boring business people step in and do the boring business stuff. So very shortly after Miyoko Shinner's initial statement on LinkedIn, she posted another statement announcing that a few of the board members were suing her. She said, I'm shocked that certain board members have decided to file a lawsuit against me. There are wild untruths about me that are designed to destroy me and get me out of the way. Okay, so what were these wild untruths that she's referring to from the lawsuit? According to the lawsuit, Shinner allegedly raided the company's internal cloud storage and downloaded vast amounts of data, including research and development materials containing the company's most valuable intellectual property its proprietary recipes and plant-based culture configurations. The lawsuit also alleges Shinner copied company data, including 24,000 documents to her personal cloud storage and tried to cover her tracks. It has footage it claims shows Shinner and a former employee removing cheese cultures and product prototypes from a warehouse, quote, illegally and without the company's authorization. So obviously some pretty major allegations that if true would certainly not bode well for Miyoko or really not look good for her. But again, these are allegations and Miyoko is calling them wild untruths. On March 2nd, it was announced that Miyoko would be represented by Lisa Bloom, who is a very established attorney. She's been involved in lots of high profile cases and notably, she's also a vegan. The statement released by Lisa Bloom's firm contains some pretty heavy allegations from Miyoko with a promise of a countersuit. Miyoko's own complaints of toxic and sexist behavior by certain male executives were swept under the rug and then she was demoted and fired. We will be filing our own claims soon. In the time since filming and editing this video, Miyoko and Lisa Bloom have filed a countersuit. The main complaints or allegations are of gender discrimination, failure to prevent discrimination, retaliation, wrongful termination, and misusing her name and life. The countersuit claims that the COO of the company singled out and openly denigrated women, especially Miyoko. It claims he mistreated women at the company by excluding them from meetings, denying them information, berating them, and openly denigrating them. Shinner claims she complained to several investors in the company, including James Joaquin, and also to the company's HR department. And it says that after these formal complaints, she was terminated on July 28th, 2022. So obviously a lot of pretty serious allegations, and we will just have to continue to stay tuned and see what we hear. So now let's get into Miyoko Shinner's history. A lot of this timeline comes from a 2018 podcast she did with the Chick Peeps. It's a great podcast episode. I'll link it below. And then some of this information comes from an Eater article, which I will also link below. Miyoko Shinner is originally from Japan. She was born in a town outside of Tokyo, but moved to California at age seven, where she grew up in Mill Valley, California. She went vegetarian in the 1960s at age 12, which she states was for animal rights reasons, but she was a huge cheese aficionado and she even went on a cheese tasting trip through Europe. She said that a baguette with some great cheese and a bottle of wine to her signified the good life, asking, 
how could life get any better? Miyoko ended up going vegan in the 1980s, a time that she calls the dark ages of vegan cheese. She went vegan because she couldn't tolerate dairy anymore, but she said it was really hard and she missed cheese so much. She said she had to start thinking outside of the box and she really loved to cook and was a self-taught chef. At this point, she was living in Tokyo and she started selling vegan pound cakes out of her backpack. And she also started experimenting with tofu, trying to create something just as rich as cheese. She would marinate the tofu in miso and then she experimented with different oils and marinating times. And this became her first version of cheese. However, these didn't really satisfy her. So she just kind of gave up on creating her ideal version of cheese sort of just lost the taste for it and accepted life without it. But according to the Eater article, these early experimentations lit an entrepreneurial spark within her. She thought, if I'm going to invent these new foods, then I might as well sell them too. In 1988, she opened a restaurant called Now in Zen in San Francisco, where she served, quote, very rudimentary cheeses alongside other dishes. In 1991, she came out with the Now in Zen Epicure cookbook, which was a pretty standard cookbook with a variety of recipes in it. In 1995, she debuts a product called Unturkey at the Natural Products Expo, alongside Tofurkey as one of her competitors. And just a really fun fact in the timeline, almost two decades later, Seth Tibbet, who was the founder of Tofurkey, became the first investor in Miyoko's Creamery. He was just like, I'm just glad you're not trying to compete with me anymore. Here's some money for your cheese business. In 2003, she ended up closing down her restaurant and she attributed its demise to a lack of interest in vegan food. In the early 2000s, she came back to cheese making, determined to get it right this time. By 2012, she had clearly perfected her cheese recipes because this is the year she came out with Artisan Vegan Cheese, the cookbook. She said she really kind of saw that as her contribution to the world. She was like, okay, I've done it. I've put it out there. Here you go. I'm done. But she got a lot of feedback that although people thought the recipes looked amazing, they didn't actually want to have to make them themselves. And so they asked her, can't you just make them and sell them and we will buy them? Since she had been an entrepreneur for the last 30 years, she was really hesitant to start a new endeavor in her 50s but finally she caved and decided to do it. In 2014, she launched Miyoko's Creamery, which was actually originally called Miyoko's Kitchen. She tells a story on the Chick Peeps about how the business was originally her and three other employees. They decided to launch as an online business only. They launched on a Friday and by Monday, they had 50,000 orders. So obviously from the very beginning, this company was an overnight success, but it was difficult because they didn't have the capacity or the capability to fulfill that many orders. And I think this goes to show she really had a problem from the very beginning of meeting consumer demand. And I think this kind of leads to us understanding why she would take on so much investment because she kind of had to. She had to scale the production facilities. She had to hire more people. So now let's discuss the Miyoko's Creamery product launch timeline because like I said before, I think it really gives us some interesting insight into possibly some of the struggles the company was having. I did find most of these dates by searching Veg News just for like Miyoko's or like Miyoko's products and filtering through because Veg News posted pretty much anytime Miyoko launched a new product, but it was hard to find info for the very early days of the company. So like I said, they launched in 2014 and it seemed like the artisan cheese wheels were their first product. The mozzarella and the butter seemed to launch around the same time, possibly in 2016. And it's funny because if you had asked me what Miyoko's first product was, I would have said the mozzarella. I think the mozzarella is what really started to put them on the map and take them to the next level in terms of consumer awareness. In January 2018, they launched their pub cheese, which is now called the Roadhouse cheese in three flavors. In January 2019, they announce a new line of more affordable nut-free cheeses made from potatoes, beans, and seeds. And this is referring to what eventually became the cheddar and pepper jack. Also in September 2019, they announced the cultured vegan oat butter, which is said to be launching in early 2020 alongside the new nut-free cheeses. I realized on this timeline that I don't have when the cream cheese launched, and that's just because 
I don't know when it launched. I'm guessing it was sometime between 2016 and 2018. In February 2020, the vegan pizza mozzarella is announced exclusively for restaurants, and it debuted at a pizza chain in Northern California. In March 2020, the farmhouse cheddar and pepper jack cheeses are announced alongside their new oat butters. So if you guys remember, in March 2020, I ordered the pre-release bundle for these products and I did a taste test video. If you haven't seen that and you want to, I will link it up here. In April 2020, the Cheddar and Pepper Jack Slices and Shreds launch at Whole Foods and some time not too long after that they also launched Blocks. In May 2021, they launched kid-friendly vegan cheddar cheese sticks. In March 2022, they launched the Liquid Pizza Mozzarella to the public and of course I made a video about that product as well. In March of 2022, there is a Veg News article announcing a high-protein vegan vegan cottage cheese made from watermelon seeds that was set to launch, quote, early 2023. I didn't even remember hearing about this, and I have never heard anything about this product ever since. Also in March of 2022, Miyoko announces the discontinuation of the Cheddar and Pepper Jack line, and we are going to come back to this. In February 2023, a Veg News article announces the launch of the Cinnamon Raisin Cream Cheese, and I thought it was kind of funny because the headline said something like, Miyoko's shows no signs of slowing down. Looking at the timeline, they had, in fact, shown signs of slowing down. There seemed to be a ton of momentum in 2018 to 2020, but from 2020 to now, there have barely been any new product launches from them. Given the rate of growth for those two years, I would have expected from 2020 to now for there to have been many more new products added. But not only did that momentum slow, Actually, things regressed because they ended up taking products away. They took away the cheddar shreds, slices, blocks, and sticks, the pepper jack shreds, slices, blocks, two of the Roadhouse flavors, and the garlic oat butter. So that is 10 products total that were launched and then removed, mostly between 2020 and 2022. Like I said, I wanted to come back to discussing the cheddar and pepper jack. Miyoko made a statement on their website about the decision to discontinue these products in March of 2022. As a rapidly growing company, we tripped up. We acted too fast and ended up compromising our craft with the launch of our line of cheddar and pepper jack slices, shreds, and blocks. Because of this, I've made the decision to discontinue them. And then in bold, this was a lesson learned. Going forward, I will no longer be putting anything else on the market that I cannot put 100% confidence in and that I don't believe is the best quality product in the world. This is my promise to you. This is what I've learned. As our company grows, I am determined to make sure we stay true to our original core values. One of the complaints that I didn't mention earlier from the lawsuit is that she removed products, and this is clearly what they were referring to. In 2020, Shinner championed the release of new cheese products that came in both slices and shreds, but then she unilaterally discontinued these products in early September 2021, revealing her decision to the board only after she told key retail customers about the discontinuation of a major product line. If you watch the taste test that I did of those products, you will remember that Paul and I were very disappointed in the cheddar in particular. I personally did not think that it lived up to Miyoko's very high standards. It's all right. It almost tastes like a protein bar. Yeah, it's good. It, it's not, um... It's not as good as I was expecting. No, no, it's not. My, my like, expectations, my expectations were super high. Were so high too. And Miyoko herself seemed to agree. And reading between the lines of her statement, it sounds like she was maybe pressured to put those products out before she felt they were ready. But although these products may not have been up to Miyoko's standards, it seemed like they were pretty popular and I would have to guess profitable. So while I can totally understand Miyoko's incredibly high standards for the products she put out, I can also understand the investor's frustration with her pulling a product from the market that was seemingly doing well and making the company money. I had definitely noticed a slowdown in the product releases and I think when a company has that really positive momentum that they seem to have between 2018 and 2020, 
it's good to keep that momentum rolling. And we could definitely say that the pizza mozzarella was a new product. It did come out to the public in 2022, but it actually originally came out in 2020, as we saw from the timeline. So I consider that a product that was sort of like researched, developed, tested, finished in 2020. So now that we're all up to speed on the drama and the timelines, should we still continue to support Miyoko's Creamery and buy their products? Like I said, I know very little about the world of venture capital, CEOs, startups, founders, etc. But I found this really fascinating and illuminating article in Harvard Business Review called The Founder's Dilemma. Now, this article is actually from 2008, but it could not feel more relevant to this situation. I'm gonna read a few excerpts and I think you guys will see what I mean. Every would-be entrepreneur wants to be a Bill Gates, a Phil Knight, or an Anita Roddick, each of whom founded a large company and led it for many years. However, successful CEO cum founders are a very rare breed. I analyzed 200 12 American startups. By the time the ventures were three years old, 50% of founders were no longer the CEO. In year four, only 40% were still in the corner office and fewer than 25% led their company's initial public offerings. Founders don't let go easily though. Four out of five entrepreneurs, my research shows, are forced to step down from the CEO's post. Most are shocked when investors insist that they relinquish control, and they're pushed out of office in ways they don't like and well before they want to abdicate. In my experience, founders often make decisions that conflict with the wealth maximization principle. As I studied the choices before entrepreneurs, I noticed that some options had the potential for generating higher financial gains, but others, which founders often chose, conflicted with the desire for money. There is, of course, another factor motivating entrepreneurs along with the desire to become wealthy, the drive to create and lead an organization. The surprising thing is that trying to maximize one imperils achievement of the other. Founders are usually convinced that only they can lead their startups to success. I'm the one with the vision and the desire to build a great company. I have to be the one running it. From the get-go, employees, customers, and business partners identify startups with their founders who take great pride in their founder cum CEO status. Many entrepreneurs are overconfident about their prospects and naive about the problems they will face. Founders' attachment, overconfidence, and naivete may be necessary to get new ventures up and running, but these emotions later create problems. They invite family members and friends, angel investors, or venture capital firms to invest in their companies. In doing so, they pay a heavy price. They often have to give up total control over the enterprise. As a company becomes more successful, the venture's finances become more complex, and the CEO needs to depend on finance executives and accountants. The organization has to become more structured, and the CEO has to create formal processes, develop specialized roles, and yes, institute a managerial hierarchy. The dramatic broadening of the skills that the CEO needs at this stage stretches most founders' abilities beyond their limits. Thus, the faster that founder CEOs lead their companies to the point where they need outside funds and new management skills, the quicker they will lose management control. Success makes founders less qualified to lead the company and changes the power structure so that they are more vulnerable. Congrats, you're a success. Sorry, you're fired. If the need for change is clear to the board, why isn't it clear to the founder? Because the founder's emotional strengths become liabilities at this stage. Used to being the heart and soul of their ventures, founders find it hard to accept lesser roles and their resistance triggers traumatic leadership transitions. I don't know about you guys, but I was kind of mind blown by how relevant a lot of this analysis felt to this particular situation. And I think that's because Although this feels to us like so unfair to Miyoko and like how could they be doing this to her and this is a travesty, in fact, it seems like this is sort of just what happens in companies when they become more successful, when they take on capital. I don't think it's a great system, but it seems like it is the system and it seems like this situation is not unique to Miyoko at all. I do wanna bring up the point that Miyoko is not only a female founder, she's also a person of color. And these two things are unfortunately pretty rare in the world of CEOs. Obvious Ventures even ironically posted this to LinkedIn on International Women's Day. Only 6.6% .6 of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. It's obvious we need more women leaders. And then they posted this graphic of like, look at all the companies we've invested in that have a female CEO and or co-founder. But it's kind of ironic because I'm like, well, where's the data about like 
how long after you invested that they still were the CEO. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm finally going to answer the question, will I continue to support Miyoko's? And my answer is yes, I will continue supporting both Miyoko's Creamery and Miyoko Shinner. Miyoko said herself in her initial statement that she wishes the best for the company she founded, led, and grew. To me, that was her first statement that she released after the news of her firing was announced, and I think she chose all all the words she said in that statement very carefully. She specifically said she wishes the best for the company, which I take to mean she still wants the company to succeed. James Joaquin from Obvious Ventures said Miyoko is still a large owner of the company and still on the board. When we buy a Miyoko's Creamery product, we are still financially supporting Miyoko Shinner. In my opinion, it's definitely different from the buy Chloe situation where, to my understanding, Chloe was fired from the company and left with absolutely nothing. Also, as I discussed in my unpopular vegan opinions video, it is hard to be vegan. And I'm not saying it's hard to live life without animal products, but it can be hard being vegan in a world that is so aggressively non-vegan. It can be hard to find products that you like. It can be hard to get access, whether it's financially or locationally to those products. I am not willing to make my life that much more difficult or unpleasant every time a vegan company does something imperfect. And I'm certainly not going to encourage other to do so either. As we live in a capitalist society and people say there is no ethical consumption under capitalism, the bigger veganism becomes and the bigger these vegan companies become, the more like shitty and shady business decisions are going to be happening. But there's shitty and shady business decisions happening at pretty much every company, whether they're vegan or not. So it's kind of like we're buying into this system by living in the countries we live in and shopping the places we shop, consuming the products we consume. I don't really think we're harming anyone but ourselves when we decide to boycott these companies. I'll be completely honest, from an emotional standpoint, I love Miyoko's products. They're such a big part of my life and I really don't wanna give them up. But also looking at the situation logically, I don't think it's completely black and white, and I also don't think we know enough yet, right? There's a lot that we don't know. Like I said, Miyoko herself says she wishes the best for her company. To me, it doesn't sound like she wants us to boycott. I also feel strongly about supporting Miyoko in whatever comes next in her life. I already have her Artisan Vegan Cheese cookbook. I encourage others to, you know, buy her cookbooks, follow her personal social media accounts, donate to or support her animal sanctuary, and just keep an eye on what's next for her. Because I am sure that whatever endeavor she embarks upon next is going to be delicious and phenomenally vegan. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this discussion. I hope you found it interesting or informative. Let me know down below what your thoughts are on this whole topic, especially if you're just hearing about it for the first time. But if you're not hearing about it for the first time, was there any new information I was able to give? Or did you change your mind at all about things while watching? I'd love to hear any and all of your thoughts. Give this video a thumbs up if you found it interesting or informative. Subscribe to my channel for future videos, and I will see you again soon. Bye.